Hi everybody, I'm Jesse Trank. I'm an applications engineer with Mastercam and I'm here at the Mastercam headquarters in Tallinn, Connecticut. I'm in the manufacturing lab. Uh, we have a bunch of CNC's in here, uh, including the Haas UMC 750 that's behind me. We're gonna kinda work through some things today um, on this machine. And, and I'll actually show you some machining video, machine simulation. And then the coolest thing that we're gonna go through is some new features in Mastercam 2022. So you're gonna to get to see a sneak peek of the software. So let's get into some new functionality with Mastercam 2022. I'll go over to the wireframe tab, and this is kind of typically what you're used to seeing inside of Mastercam, even in prior releases. Well, there's a new dropdown up on the ribbon here that's standard and simplified. If I click on simplified, you'll notice that a lot of the peripheral functions, some of the least used functions inside of Mastercam have been stripped from the interface. This is gonna be really nice for like, people like students, teachers, uh, even basic users that are getting familiar with the software uh, to kind of you know, not be cluttered with as much on that interface. Even as an advanced user, this is gonna be kind of nice to, to simplify things. You know, I'm, I'm not always using a lot of those complex functions that are in there, things like stair geometry. That's not something I do every day. Uh, so why do I have to look through that and click through that? This, this makes it very nice. So with that, let's jump into showing some new functionality. So the first thing I'm going to do, I, I typically start with a, a template file like this. I just have the UMC 750 table here in this part file, and I still need to bring in my fixturing and bring in the part file. In prior releases, that would be two separate instances of merge pattern. But now I can go in and pick those files that I wanna use. So I'll navigate over to this folder here, and I have my Lang fixturing and my part. I can click on both of those, hold down the control key, and bring in two files at the same time. That was something you couldn't do prior to Mastercam 2022. So I'll just green check out of there. Now I have to take this part, you know, the part's floating up in space over the fixture. I gotta bring that part down on the fixture. It didn't come in in the proper space that I wanted to. So I'll go to Transform Dynamic, Standard, just like you would do in old releases. I'll pick that part and drop the axis combo down on it. So one unique feature with 2022 is that I can now click these axis labels and that will index over to that spot on the part. So I can look down along the X axis or down along the Y axis. Previously, I would have to use either my 3D mouse or my center mouse button to get and see those planes but I'm gonna come over here to the x-axis, grab the z-arrow, and bring this right down on top of the part. All right. So a very small little change, but it's, it's a nice function. I find it's the type of function that I find myself when I go back to previous releases, I'm missing that. I try to click on the axis label and nothing happens. So it's, it's one of those things that you get used to really quickly. So I'll green check out. All right, so now I wanna cover something that's not standard functionality or standard workflow inside of Mastercam. Most people don't do this, but it's something that I started doing. I really like it, and I, I like to show people how to do it. And that is using a stock model as your first operation in Mastercam. Most of the time when we think of stock models, we're thinking of you know, create a stock model after a roughing operation to reflect that roughing operation and then do rest roughing. Instead, I'm using a stock model to define my stock for machining. So I'll go to Toolpaths, Stock Model. I'll give this a name, I'll call this Stock. I do wanna be in the top plane here. And I like to give my stock models an individual color. Uh, that helps me differentiate those uh, moving forward. When, as I get more and more stock models in my part, it's really nice to be able to look at those colors and understand where those roughing operations came from. So I'll green check out. And I also encourage the use of using the glass material mode for stock models. Makes it really nice to see through the stock and see that part and understand where there's material and where there's not. For the initial stock shape, I'll pick model and I'll navigate over to my levels manager. With a triple click, I can grab that solid as my stock. I'll shut that back off. And I don't really need to worry about source operations here because there is no operations in the file. So I'll green check out here and that'll generate that stock model. So we head over to our toolpaths tab here. 
with the T key on my keyboard, I can shut that stock on and off, right? And I can see through, through the stock. Now, if you're noticing that you can't see through the stock, that may be because in your view tab, you have material mode turned off. So you do need material mode turned on in order to, to utilize that glass material mode in your stock models. All right, so let's now move on to roughing. So a lot of times what most people will do is create an OptiRough operation right off the get-go if they have a mill 3D license with OptiRough. Um, I like to encourage kind of looking at it and seeing if you can use 2D Dynamic to remove as much material as possible. 2D Dynamic is tough to beat for efficiency. It's gonna do a really nice job of keeping that tool engaged. Uh, that dynamic motion, you just cannot beat it. So let's look at creating a 2D, we're gonna actually do two different 2D dynamic operations. One doing this bottom step and then step up and do this top one. So I'll head over to my tool paths tab, select dynamic mill. So this is where you'll notice the first change with 2D dynamic. You're going to see this automatic regions up at the top of the chaining dialog. That's new for 2022. Now hold on to that for a second because we're gonna circle back around on that on the second operation. For the first one, we're gonna chain like we normally would. So for my machining regions, I'm going to pick the outside of this stock and I'll just do a exterior loop here, just like that. And then avoid, I want to avoid the part itself. So I'll grab this loop right here. All right. Now, one thing that I really encourage is to use preview chains when you're doing any of this 2D chaining. That's going to allow you to see that you've actually selected what you thought you selected. And you're not gonna spend time calculating something that's going to fail anyway or give you results you don't really want. So I'll hit the preview chains and you'll see that I've got this black and red checkered area, that's the material I'm removing. And then this blue area, that's the air region, that's air. The tool is free to move around in there. The algorithm is going to know that there's no material there. So this is giving what I want. I'll green check out and I will select my half inch Vidia five flute tool. Cut parameters, I want about a 10% step over. And then for linking, I just wanna make sure that that tool drops down far enough beyond the part. Since my WCS is at the bottom of the part or the top of the fixture, I know that's got a 60 thousandths radius on the tool. I'm gonna to add a, or I'm going to subtract 80 thousandths from the depth. I'll green check out. That'll generate the toolpath, and I've got a nice clean toolpath coming from the outside, just like I envisioned. All right, so now let's move up to that top shelf, and this is where we're gonna use that new 2022 functionality with the auto region chaining. So I'll select a dynamic toolpath. I'll pick an automatic region. I just select the face. You'll see it grabbed a lot of different chains there, but now it's gonna make some intelligent choices. What it, what Mastercam actually thinks I want to do here. I'll green check out. And again, this becomes even more critical to use preview chains because now you have the software choosing those chains for you. You really need to see what that's going to be or you're going to spend time generating toolpaths that, that might not be what you want. So I'll hit preview chains and look at that. It gives me exactly what I want on that top shelf. So that, that's pretty impressive, I think. Uh, you know, if it doesn't give you what you want, you can always use this green arrow, convert automatic regions to standard regions. So I do that and it gives me a machining region and an air region. I can go in now and modify that solid chain to be what I want. But the first guess that this, that this uh, auto regions made was correct. So I'll green check out. Now, really, I'm gonna leave all my parameters set the same. I wanna make sure I have that same half inch video tool. The only thing I'm gonna make sure of is that my linking is set to the proper location. And you'll see that it auto-populated that depth just to double check the software, it was correct. So that should do what I want. Green check out. And that's going to generate. And there you go. Got another nice tool path here. Of course, I'm spending a lot of time, you can see those brown moves, those are micro lifts, so it's not retracting over the top of the part. That might not be the most efficient, it'll work, 
Um, I can always go back into my cut parameters and adjust that. But now that I've got these two roughing tool paths, what I want to do is go into verify and see what it looks like, right? So I'll start by going into my simulator options and selecting the stock model. I'll use that previously selected stock model called stock. I'll green check out of there. I select both these tool paths and launch verify. I'll make this full screen here. Now, one thing I really like to do with, um, I'm gonna turn the work piece on as well. One thing I really like to do with verify is I wanna make sure that my color loop is on. That really gives me some, um, some indication about what toolpath did what. So let's start this. And right off the bat, I see I've got some issues here, right? So there's no real reason to run through this whole simulation because I can see that that tool is gouging, you know, I don't have enough stick out on my holder. Now, typically what I would do is I would exit out of verify, go back into Mastercam and use some tools that already exist there to, to set my projection, projection right or do multiple depth cuts or go to a different holder or tool setup. But in Mastercam 2022, we have some really cool analytical tools some dimensioning tools that I can use right inside of Verify to understand how much I've got to move that stuff. So I'm going to use this distance. And this allows me to pick arcs, curves, uh, vertices, edges on the part. So I'll pick this bottom edge and then I'll pick a top edge up here. And you'll see I've got a, a 3D distance there, which doesn't really help me. But if I turn on details, I can see that I'm gouging with the holder by 0.73 inches. So now I know I can either just lift up my linking parameters by about three quarters of an inch, or I have to set my projection deeper and do depth cuts or do a different holder assembly uh, that, that will allow for clearance there, or I've got to rough off the top by three quarters before I go and run this tool path. So let's head back over to Mastercam. Another neat feature that you could use for this, I'm gonna turn on translucency and turn on that stock. Another neat feature you could use is going over to the view tab. This is new for 2022 is this show tool. If I say display tool from selected operation and then I go over here, right? This is going to make that tool holder combination my cursor, right? So I can actually leave this on full time and select different parts of the tool. But if I just index over here, you know, I can see that I would have had some gouging issues really quickly, right? That's showing exactly what I saw in Verify. Um, you know, this isn't something that I like to leave on all the time. It does get a little annoying when you're trying to select with, with that tool holder combination, but it definitely has its uses inside of programming in Mastercam. So from here, I wanna go in and adjust those, those linking parameters so that my tool, my holder is no longer gouging on the stock. So let's do that. I'm going to shut this stock back off and I'm going to turn translucency mode back off. Um, I'm going to go back into this first tool path and I'm just going to add three quarters of an inch. That way we know we've got a little clearance on the top of the holder to make sure that we're not gouging anymore. Obviously I'm going to have to come in and clear out that bottom again, but that can be done once the rest of the roughing has occurred. I'm still getting most of the material off in a very, very efficient way. All right, so now I wanna go in and update what my stock looks like so that I can do some rest machining from here. So I'm gonna copy this stock model down. And then I'm gonna go in and update it. Again, I love using individual colors uh, for my stock model. Really helps me distinguish what's going on there. I've got glass mode set. I do wanna update this stock model, the initial stock shape to be looking at that previous stock. And then for source operations, select these two. So once that generates, you can see with the different colors, it's really easy to tell where that stock, you know, which operation removed that stock. I can see that those two previous operations were the yellow and, and removed most of the material. So now I can use this stock model for an opti rest to go in and kind of take this top off. So I'll go to tool paths, 3D, opti rough, 
So for machining, I'll just give a quick triple click to the model and that'll select the whole thing. Hit end selection. I'll set my wall and floor to five thousandths. And then I'll check my cut parameters. I wanna do about a 200% step down and a 10% step over. Steep shallow, I'm gonna set up so that it goes down to, you know, the top of this shelf here. And for stock, I wanna make sure that I turn on rest material and that it's looking at that previously made stock model. So the last thing I wanna show is underneath toolpath control, this isn't new for 2022, but it is new to 2021, is the skip pockets. If I skip all pockets, that's going to allow me to stay outside of all these internal pockets. Now, one other thing you might notice that I'm doing is I'm able to move around and look at the graphics screen while inside this toolpath dialog. I'm no longer locked out like I was in previous releases to Mastercam. So I can actually have my toolpath dialogs up on a second monitor, which, which is really nice and really helps efficiency. So I'm no longer locked out of the interface while working in these toolpath parameters. All right, so let's generate that toolpath. And that's gonna take a second to generating. It is in the uh, multi-threading manager, which release after release, we are getting better at at multi-threading and quicker with, with those tool paths. So I can take a look at how that's going. So now that we've got our roughing completed, we can move on to finishing. To do that, I'm going to actually launch a 3D waterline tool path. And to do this 3D waterline, we're gonna actually look at machining this end here. So, I'm gonna leave five thousandths on the walls and the floors. I'll pick this surface here. And then I'm gonna go and pick all the adjacent surfaces for avoidance. And I can actually hold down the control key that'll help me uh, pick a lot of those surfaces simultaneously. So I'll end selection there. Our cut parameters, I'm just gonna do a 50,000 step over here just to kind of speed things up so things generate quickly. All right, so now we're gonna go over and select the tool. For this tool path, I'm gonna use an eighth inch ball end mill. So I'll go over to my tool, select this eighth inch ball. And then from here, I wanted to show you the new linking parameters in Mastercam 2022. So in the past, you didn't have as much control over your lead in, lead outs, and your transitions between gaps inside of the 3D finishing tool paths. So for now, I'm gonna just gonna generate this as is, and then we'll go in and look at this in a second. So with advanced toolpath display on, I have that on right now, I can see the differences between lead outs and lead ins, lead ins being the green, lead outs being the red. And then your rapids are yellow, just like they would in the normal display. Now, let's say I wanted to change the lead ins and lead outs, the lead ins to be larger and the lead outs to be either non-existent or much smaller. So let's look at that in the waterline tool path. So now I can separate my lead in and lead outs and I can say, all right, I want my lead outs to be almost non-existent, but I want these lead ins to be much larger, right? So I could say I want an eighth of an inch there, eighth of an inch there, and we're making the lead outs substantially smaller, right? The other thing I wanted to point out is we now have control over an arc fit radius on the rapids. So I can put something like a three ace radius in that rapid move. So let's, let's regenerate that and see what that looks like. Okay, so now you'll see we have these radiuses on the rapids. That's gonna aid in directional changes on the machine. Some of the high-end manufacturers of machines, someone like Makino, they'll actually have this built into the control with a tolerance on the control parameters. Um, but for some of the other machines, you know, this allows us to, to eliminate some of those directional changes. 
And you'll also notice that now, just like I requested, we have these large lead ins and tiny lead outs. So you have that individual control inside of these 3D tool paths that you didn't necessarily have before. Let's launch Backplot here and take a look at this. All right. Now, one thing I want to point out, as I get down to the bottom of this toolpath, look at this. The holder is colliding with that wall of the part. You know, that's, that's going to be less than ideal. That's going to be a big gouge at best. Uh, you're probably going to have a broken tool, broken holder, uh, and possibly a damaged machine with something like this. So we've got to do something about it. We are using the UMC 750 here. We have a five axis machine at our disposal. We can, we can utilize tilting that tool away uh, for cutting this part. We could go to something like a longer tool, but that would be less than ideal because now we're introducing chatter. Um, if we went to a larger diameter tool to stick out further, we can't get down into this lower radius. So let's look at creating five axis motion in a very simplistic way, using our 3D tool paths and then creating that motion. I can do that simply using the holder checking or holder avoidance on the holder page of these tool paths. I can turn on collision checking and say tilt to avoid gouge. I'll leave something like 20 thousandths on the holder and allow it, the tool to tilt by 30 degrees. Regenning that, you'll get a message here that the tool path has been gouge checked against the holder. I know that, I don't need to see that again. All right, so a quick back plot again. So look what happens down here. I'm using the S and B keys on my keyboard. That holder is now changing its tilt to avoid the edge of that part, right? Pretty neat. And I've just made a five axis tool path using a tool path that I'm already comfortable with as a three axis programmer. There is one caveat to this, right? And before I run this on the machine, I want to actually run this through a simulation and see what happens at the machine in a digital world before I go and, and cause damage at the control. So let's talk about using machine sim for that. I'll go over to the machine tab and underneath the machine simulation group, I'll click this little arrow. For this machine simulation, since I'm using the UMC 750, I want to go down and pick the matching machine simulation here. Now, this is a post-ability machine simulation, which allows me another advantage. I can use the external post-processor to drive the machine simulation, giving me more accurate simulation. It's going to do exactly what the posted code is. I'll have things like home positions, um, safety moves in between planes. That will actually be reflected in the machine simulation. So that's really nice. So I'll hit simulate here. That's going to pop up my machine simulation. So looking at the machine simulation, you know, by default, they're going to come in with sheet metal. For me, I like to shut that off, right? Because typically with a tool path, I'm not too worried about gouging the sheet metal or banging the sheet metal. Um, if that's going to occur, I've got bigger problems. And that's really not what we're going to try and focus on for this. So I'll shut that machine housing off. And so I'm just looking at, you know, the mechanical components of the machine. So let's, let's start this. I'm going to turn the speed down a little bit and let this run. And what I really want to look at, you know, you'll see that the majority of this is all three axis motion. The rotaries are not moving, right? So let's keep running this down. And I really want to look at when that, there we go. So we've got some rotary ac action happening here. So I really want you to focus on the C axis motion here. See how much that C axis is moving while we're machining the part. So you've got a lot of rotary motion, motion and a lot of translational motion of the X, Y, Z for the amount of movement that that tool is making with the part. So the contact point of the tool is moving very little in relation to the machine motion. Now, experience based, I know that's not a good thing. It's not disastrous but it's going to cause things like chatter and you're not going to maintain feed rates up against that part because the machine's got to move so quickly for such little little motion so how can we how can we fix this what can we do well we have a five axis machine behind us here let's leverage the capability right we don't have to have this part sitting this way we can index up and do something different 
So I'm gonna jump back into Mastercam here and I'm gonna copy this waterline toolpath down. And what I'm thinking of doing is coming in from the end, coming in from this right side plane and machining this from a totally different perspective with the B up at 90 degrees. So the first thing I'll do there is change the plane. And instead of using you know, that WCS as the same tool and construction plane, I'll use the right side. Now, if I were to regenerate this as is, that's not gonna work too good because the surface is not totally horizontal, but almost horizontal with that. And that's really where waterline's not gonna do a great job. So I also wanna change the toolpath type to something like a raster. And I'm just gonna make sure my, yeah, step over is still staying big. So that should be good. Uh, the other issue we're going to be having now is we still have this wall. This used to be the floor, but now that we're coming in from the side, this is going to become a wall that that holder can hit. So, you know, we have an issue there. The nice thing is that model geometry still stays selected and we can still see that we have that selected as avoidant. So it shouldn't really be a big deal. I'll hit the green check and let that generate. We're still allowing that same holder avoidance. We're gonna allow that tilt to happen. So let's do a quick back plot on this. If you take a look, the majority of it is staying three axis. And then down at this edge, we're getting that same tilting motion up to 30 degrees that we allowed in the last path. So if we're still tilting, this should have the same motion that we had uh, in that last machine simulation but that's actually not going to be the case. So let's relaunch machine sim. Okay, so looking at this machine simulation, we're gonna run this, and you're gonna notice that, again, the majority of the toolpath is three axis. Of course, the B is up at 90 degrees now. What we really wanna focus on is when this starts rotating. All right, so we're starting to get some rotational movement here. Pay attention to that C axis, pay attention to the B axis, and look at how much the tool is moving across the part as those rotaries are engaged, okay? So we're almost getting more movement of the tool across the part than we are rotational or translational change of the machine. This is gonna be very good. This means that that machine can maintain the chip load and the, the cutting speed relative to the part uh, as we move through that part. It's gonna, gonna result in less chatter and just be an overall better scenario for cutting. So we put together a comparison video showing these two scenarios and you get to see it live on the machine and really see how that moves. It's one thing to look at it in a virtual environment, but when it's real, it's totally different. These changes will have a massive effect on machine cycle time and surface finish. Just by changing something as simple as the plane in your approach to tool pathing, you can have a huge impact on finished part quality, cycle time, and then ultimately your bottom line. In order to properly leverage these tools though, you need to first be aware of them and practice your Mastercam skill. Mastercam programming is a form of art and it must be learned and practiced constantly. Second here to see if he can get his uh, camera turned on. And hopefully we can get some Q&A going here. I did, I did see some questions about looking a little more closely at the machine sim. I don't know if people still want to see that or not. I think they they do. If you're able to okay. share your screen, sure. yeah, I'll give her. Let me know when you can see it, Mike. Um, not oh, something's coming. Something's coming. Here we go. Yeah, I got your mesh sim on screen now. Okay. So I don't know if anyone, if you want to go into the Q&A, if you had some specific questions about it, but I was just going to let it run through a little slower and kind of talk through what, what you just saw. But um, basically on those those toolpaths that we programmed or that I programmed, it's it's staying in three axis for the majority of the cut. That's what that uh, holder avoidance, that tilt to avoid is going to do. And then once it's needed and only once it's needed, it's going to tilt just enough to move out of there. So even though I specified up to a 30 degree tilt, right, that's not going to happen until it's actually needed. So we could start at something like two degrees and eventually work up uh, to that 30 degrees. 
So I can zoom in here and you'll start to see the tool start to tilt. So chime in if you've got any specific questions. But what I really wanted to highlight here, and that's what we were kind of focusing on, was how much motion we got out of that out of that um, table when you're sitting with the B axis at zero, right? And that's all due to the kinematics of the machine. To solve the angle that's needed, that machine needs to move in a certain way. Um, so by tilting that B up to 90 degrees, we're able to, to fully take advantage of the kinematics of the machine and, and do a much better job with less, less motion of, on the rotaries. Right, right, right. Yeah, so George was saying, can you zoom in? Um, I'm not sure what he's wanting to see exactly, but uh, yeah, George, if you want to know, if you can let us know yeah, what you exactly just, you want to see. Yeah, you can see that that tool, see how it's just tilting just around and just missing the part. Uh, Elder has <clears throat> made a comment here about it being at B45. So what would the difference be? I guess it might take you some time to build that tool path out. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at at I think we'll just kind of discuss it at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a great question. And if I were to program this, I would probably try it, right? Yeah. Give it a shot at B45. That might be your first guess. What I can tell you is anything outside of B0 up to 30 degrees is going to be better because we're specifying up to a 30 degree tilt. That's allowing a chance for it to get back to zero in that 30 degree tilt. So if we go more than 30 degrees, you're going to solve some of these kinematic issues that you have with the C-axis whipping around. And what happens when you start to see, you know, this is something we run into all the time. Somebody buys a five-axis machine and they want to see those axes just whipping around. Yeah. Right? The boss <laughs> the boss comes in and says, this is a five-axis machine. It should be moving. Exactly. Right? exactly. When, when realistically the least amount of motion that you can make to cut a feature successfully is going to be the best toolpath that you can program, right? You, you want yeah. as many axes as you can lock at a given time. If you can cut it in four axis, well, then you should be cutting it in four axis, right? right. Um, that's, that's something that's really hard to get across to people, especially if they're new to, to the five axis world and the five axis environment. As soon as you unlock a, a, a rotary, you've given it a whole nother degree of freedom and a whole nother opportunity to make mistakes. So. Yeah, exactly. I, again, the more things that are le are able to move, the looser things become, and the less you know you're going to lose surface finish, accuracy, all exactly. that kind of stuff, right? Yep, yep. And and feed rate, cycle time comes. Right. You know, that's a that's a big sacrifice too. So there's a question here: Is it possible to have both ways cutting for area roughing strategy? If you if not, are you planning on adding it? Uh, so you're talking about I'm thinking opti rough. Uh, must be yes, area roughing strategy. Yeah, probably yeah, assuming rough. Opti rough. Are you able to do both? Because yeah, it's so dynamic we can do both ways, right? Yeah, and and opti rough. Yeah, so two D dynamic, you can do zigzag, and in opti, you can do zigzag as well. And you also have in twenty twenty two, you also have full control of that um, conventional feed rate as well. Right. And we had we had control of it before, but we didn't have the percentage and the feed rate fields. It was it was just a it wasn't quite as nice as it is in 2022. So that okay. was a great question, and we've yeah. had we've had some awesome success with that too. Uh, I know one of our guys on the partnerships team was working with um, Iscar on some titanium components, and they are actually zigzag roughing with dynamic, uh, conventional, and climb with an 80 percent step over two times D in titanium. It was wow. unreal. I mean, obviously, you got to have the carbide to support that sort of thing, but there, there is a use for it. Yeah, I've, I've never used the the zigzagging. I've always kind of wondered uh, if you compared tool life of a zigzag versus strict, strictly conventional. Yeah, what, what it would so, be. So, so, so zigzag is only when when site when you're after cycle time, and you don't care about tool life, right? So and there are there are. are yeah, you you are you're putting the tool in a non-optimal condition, right? Um, but there are times where the tool life is less important than the cycle time, and obviously Absolutely. that needs to be Absolutely. evaluated yeah. on a project by project base. So, case. 
Okay, uh, I got another question here from uh, Michael Scott. On MashCam 2020, I click on machine simulation. I get the error saying operation having the ID 14 was not found. Please try to regenerate thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> that's a tough I one would, to troubleshoot, I guess, yeah, eh? Yeah, I would, we'd kind of, I mean, you can feel free to reach out to any of us or send <clears> it <throat> into tech support or something. We can take a look at it. Um, I ha I'm not going to say that I've never seen that error before because I have. Um, you know, I'm going to start with the typical tech support tip, and that is restart Mastercam and try it again. Yeah, um, you try turning it off and back on, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but beyond that, we'd have to see the file. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, follow for that one is, uh, yeah, we need some more information. Uh, another question here Will the check tool reach selection need to be launched again after you use the tilt tool? Will the check tool reach selection? Need to be relaunched so, oh, after you use check. tilt tool. Oh, check tool reach. He's asking about the check tool reach, I think, in the analyze tab. Will it need to be relaunched again after you use the tilt tool? I don't believe check tool reach has the capability to take into account five axis motion. So check tool reach is, I don't want to say it's a three axis tool, but it's a planar tool. So it's only looking down. It's looking down from specified plane. So I, the answer is uh, no, it won't need to be relaunched again because I don't think you're going to get a different result. Okay. Another question just popped up here. When programming fourth axis, can you control when the axis will rotate and when it will just use the three axis motion and keep the rotary stationary? So a couple answers to that, specifically as it applies to what we just saw where we're using the holder avoidance. Holder avoidance is a five axis capability. Mm -hmm. um, that is going to use all five axes to do that. Uh, you're not gonna be able to specify to only tilt in four axis. That being said, if we're using tilt to avoid, that is a multi-axis license functionality. So that's assuming that you have multi-axis capability. Mm -hmm. um, you can use any of the, what you can do, use any of the five axis tool paths to lock to four axis and use like a collision control strategy to tilt. Uh, that's actually what's happening in the background here when we're doing these 3D tool paths. But they, they're basically outputting to a convert to five axis in the background uh, with predefined settings that we know to work reasonably well um, for all these 3D tool paths. And they're doing a full five axis conversion on that tool path. Um, you could, if you did it manually, like I take this, uh, if I go to right here, convert to five axis, I could select this tool path to five axis. I could go in and say, all right, I want to use this 3D, oh, right here, 3D water line. And then I can say in my tool axis control, I only want to use four axis. So it is possible to do. Um, it's not going to be as automated and kind of carefree as I showed in, you need, you need some, basically what I'm saying is you need some familiarity um, with the five axis tool paths and able to do exactly what you're saying, but it is possible. Right, right. right. Okay, uh, we've got some questions coming through in the chat, chat channel over okay. here. Um, I'll, I'm gonna ask those, but just, yeah, everyone, if you wanna, if you have a question, if you can put it in the Q and A, it just makes it easier for me so I don't bounce back, back and forth here, but, uh, this one, again, might be more suited to Dave in his presentation, which is coming up next. But uh, since you used the, the postability post, maybe you can comment on this. Uh, yeah. What are the differences between the postability machine sim and the standard MC machine sim? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think I kind of covered it there. I should probably we should probably bring this uh, back to light in the Q&A of Dave's presentation or he might cover it completely. But it's yeah. the fact that you're using the uh, the post, the post processor that you would be posting the code out to the machine controller, you're using that same post processor to drive the machine simulation, right? So standard Mastercam functionality is going to drive off of what we call NCI. That's the generic um, code in the background, right? Think about when you print out a Microsoft Word, right? You're printing to any number of printers 
but there's a specific driver that converts it so it can talk to that machine. That's your post processor, right? right. Well, we're, when we use the Mastercam um, built-in machine simulation or the standard machine simulation, we're just using that generic code to drive those machine models in the simulation. What Dave is doing with postability is he's actually taking that one step further and he's post-processing the code and then running the machine. So in the standard Mastercam simulation, you're not gonna see things like uh, the post-processor inserts a safety move between your planes that you like to see where the machine moves off to some safety position at a second home position, but your post-processor does that, right? So in the Mastercam simulation, you might see a gouge there where in the postability one, you would indeed see that safety move and not see that gouge. So in a lot of cases, um, you know, you might see some some gouging and, and things that are worrisome that actually don't exist in the posted code. Um, right. And that, that's kind of a subtle difference between those two uh, platforms. Okay, another question here from uh, Elder. Is there a way to re-import a slightly different model and have all the tool paths regenerate without having to pick geometry again? It's a bit yeah. outside of what this is talking about yeah. the presentation, yeah. but, but as as with anything, it's possible. Um, and there's no there's no tool specifically that's going to give you what I think you're asking for there. Um, but there are ways through import export of operations and the way that the selection, um, you know, how you can click and drag. You can click and drag now geometry between operations um, and drag stuff on there. So there's automated ways to to get to kind of what you're talking about there. But um, I don't know, Mike, do you have any? Any well, tricks think, or, that you like? Yeah, to use? I, I think what they, he's asking, you know, if you could bring a solid works file in and then have Rev two take its place, and if you selected the pocket in Rev one, the pocket in Rev two that's now oh. been adjusted, it does automatically select yeah. it on, on the new model. So that's a great we, application for like Mastercam for SolidWorks, right? Yeah, Where we can good, work good, with good point, good point, yeah. with the configuration tables. Um, if you, if you actually go up to the Mastercam Tech Exchange, we have some Mastercam for SolidWorks demos on there that actually use configuration tables inside of SolidWorks that do that sort of thing. Um, yeah. My coworker, Chad, he programmed uh, rings. So you can go into an Excel sheet and type in your ring size and what you want engraved on your wedding band and basically hit the post button in Mastercam for SolidWorks and you have a custom ring that will come out of say something like a two inch bar stock or something. So it, it is possible. Um, that's more of, you know, doing rev changes and things like that is more of a master cam for SolidWorks. Yeah. Um, I was going to say as well with, with the, uh, the, the newer solid selections we're getting inside of the tool paths. I, I think that reselection of geometry is getting much faster. Um, so yeah, even yeah. though, yeah, you can't just take drop and everything automatically updates. I think, the replacing of the geometry is, is much faster now yeah. than it was a couple even of years ago. the uh the auto region chaining now where i'm just yes. hitting faces and i can get my all my chain what would have been i mean i've been doing some testing with that and what would have been eight to ten chains in the background now is one click on a face nice, um, nice. so yeah. an opti rough in and of itself is almost that uh automated programming on its own right um, you, you, you can, I'm not going to say you do, but you can sacrifice some efficiency over doing 2d HST. If you really know what you're doing and you want to eke every little detail out with 2d HST and 2d dynamic, you can beat it for efficiency, but okay. I can already have that thing programmed with OptiRough running on the machine. And I'm still, you know, if I was doing it with 2d HST, I'd still be over there doing my second tool path, trying to get the chains right. So, you mm -hmm. know, there is some. And that's really the direction we're trying to go with some of these, not necessarily automation in the programming process, but some tiny automation details that add up to to a more automated programming process. Right, right. Uh, what we got here? We got to, uh, maybe we'll do a couple more questions here. Let's see what's just sure. popped up. Um, let me see examples of 3D project toolpath for roughing. I don't know if we have time to do any toolpath creation right now, Eric. 
Uh, but we'll consider something like that for the next uh, the next big event. We'll look in some more more three D tool paths. Uh, it keeps jumping. It's a is a rotary device on a three axis machine. Just an indexer, unless you have a multi axis license. So what are your device on the three axis? I mean, just an indexer. Oh, I think they're asking, can you do a simultaneous yeah. cut? Yeah, you you can. Um, you're going to be doing it with a like a, a 2D tool path. And I can, so I'm not in a, I'd have to have a file all set up for that. But just to show you where that interface is. So if I pick the 2D contour inside of rotary axis control, I can use something called axis substitution. Um, where I would specify that rotary diameter and create a four axis cut. So you actually unroll the geometry down onto the flat, you program the flat, and then you re-roll the tool path um, back on the part. Um, I'm probably not gonna dive into a full axis sub no, demo yeah, no, right no, now, but yeah, yeah, but it definitely it, it is possible to do with a with a uh, with a three mil three D license. Um, that's the only way to run simultaneous four axis. Otherwise, you'd be doing just like you said, you'd be indexing with planes using all the standard mill technology that you have. Right. Okay, here's one. Uh, are you planning on <clears throat> sorry, are you planning on adding simple generic three axis post processors to be included in MasterCam? Coming from Fusion 360, there's that F word. I would like to see it in Master. So talking about basic posts. Yeah. I'm gonna assume that they are on maintenance here and and uh, yeah, if you want to comment on that one. Yeah, so if you are on maintenance, um, you you can go and download um, a generic post install. Um, I believe we moved those over. Don't quote me on this, but I believe we moved those over to the tech exchange now. That's where um, I last saw them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're moved over to the tech exchange. Uh, you do have to be a maintenance customer to have access to the tech exchange. Yeah, there's all sorts of posts in there, right? Like I think they used to all come in in. Mass they used to be. They were installed. They were installed. The reason for pulling them out of the install is that made the posts locked to a revision of Mastercam, which was silly. To to release a new post, we had to release a new version of Mastercam, right? In order for that to be installed. So now it's a separate install where you can where now we can keep updating. You know, a post is is fluid, right? Mm -hmm. It can over time it can it can change based off of needs and based off of machine requirements um so now that we have that ability to to keep revision changing that post outside of the product yeah it makes sense because yeah you're not tied to the update anymore yep uh, i think the last question here and uh it's something that you were already talking about and uh, people who are interested in seeing chad's demo ring file oh okay uh, where can they find that so that is on the master cam tech exchange um, so you'd go on to mastercam.com and then uh, go to our go to our tech exchange. I can actually here. Let's go take a quick peek here. Alrighty, perfect. So you will need to have a linked login. So you are going to need to be a maintenance customer and uh, and log in to be able to access the tech exchange. But once I log in. I can go to communities, communities, tech exchange. And if you haven't been here and you are a maintenance customer, there is so much on here um, from demo files. I mean, turnkey stuff, almost everything we machine in the manufacturing lab in Tolland uh, makes its way on here in some form or another. Um, nice. Here's the the post processors I'm locked to. You got a keyword in there. It's yeah, overriding your clear. search. It's go to the top, your keywords. I just cleared it. Oh, there you there go. go. Yeah, so there's all the post processors we were talking about. Um, and then, so if I go to sample files, let me just try ring. There's a lot of stuff in here. A lot of rings. <laughs> yeah. I should probably search master cam for solid work. There it is. Oh, there right there, go. design table rings. So if you search design tape design table rings, um, that is the MasterCam for SolidWorks demo that uses those that design table. Um, and like I said, you can drive programming in MasterCam for SolidWorks with an Excel sheet. It's pretty cool. Nice. Very nice. 
Okay, so I think uh, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. We're about uh, 10 okay. minutes before the next webinar gets rolling, so I'm going to hop over there and make sure okay. uh, Dave's all comfortable. But, yeah, Jesse, thanks for taking part, uh, Yeah, answering no all problem. these questions. That was, that was a, a run of the <laughs> a gamut there of questions there, all sorts yeah, of different Yeah, that was great. <laughs> glad, glad everybody's engaged. That makes it a lot easier. Absolutely, so. absolutely. So hope everyone got, got use out of this, enjoyed it. Um, Jesse, again, thank you very much. And as mentioned, Dave is going to be doing a presentation next, talking uh, MASH SIM. Um, and don't be afraid to ask him questions about other stuff. You can ask him about MASH SIM, posts, whatever. Um, and yeah, we'll see everyone over there. Jesse, again, thank you very much. Yeah, no and problem. Click on end, and we'll see you guys over in the next one.